Perfect. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first event in Coastal Connections. My name is Annika Smithson, and I'm going to be the host for this evening. I work as the conservation campaigner for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, who runs a chapter. And the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, or CPAWS, is a national organization dedicated to the protection of Canada's public land, ocean, and fresh water, and to ensuring parks are managed to protect the nature within them. And here in New Brunswick, we work to protect the wilderness we love and the nature we need. So I wanna thank you for joining us. And to start off, I would like to acknowledge that CPAWS New Brunswick works on the traditional and unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy, which is made up of the Wolastoque, Mi'kmaq, and Pescamohati nations, who signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. These treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands or resources, but recognized Mi'kmaq and Wallistiquay title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. If you would like to learn more about the treaties of peace and friendship, you can take a look at some of the links that will be posted in the chat box. And if you're tuning in from a different area, I encourage you to learn a land, about the land on which you reside. Uh, if you do not know, you can take a look at nativeland.ca, which shows the territories of Indigenous people around the world, and we'll also post that link in the chat. Before we jump into the discussion for this evening, I just have a few housekeeping things to go over. I'm sure that while well, people have gotten used to attending online events in the past months, a little over a year, I guess now, um, just a little reminder to be on mute unless you're going to be speaking, such as during the Q&A. And if you would like to keep your video turned off for the presentation, just to make sure we have as smooth an internet connection as possible. Also, we're gonna be using some of the features you can find at the bottom of your screen. There's a small reactions button. Um, and if you were to click on that, there's a few little reactions that can be used. Um, so during the Q&A, if you would like to ask a question, you can click on the uh, clapping hands button and I can call on you and you can unmute yourself to ask a question. So you'll be able to use that. Also the speech bubble indicates the chat. Um, please feel free to use the chat to communicate throughout the presentation, as well as to pose any questions you might have um, that can then be answered in the Q&A. Um, I'm also joined by two of my colleagues who are going to help me out behind the scenes. Emily, who's going to be our tech person, and Mel, who's monitoring the waiting room. Um, so Emily will be monitoring the chat, flagging any questions you have, posting links. And if you have any tech issues, please feel free to message her and she will help you out. All right, so that's all for housekeeping. So this evening, I'm going to first introduce you to our series um, and give a short introduction of our speaker, Bruce, who will then be presenting on the Quadi region and why he believes it's a special place to him and for all New Brunswickers. And then we're gonna have a short Q&A at the end for any questions you may have. So this evening marks the first event in our Coastal Connection speaker series. And Coastal Connections is a speaker series designed to highlight different coastal and marine areas in New Brunswick. And this fall and winter, we're highlighting the Quadi region, which is an incredible place in need of protection. Each month, we'll be having a new speaker sharing about their work in the region. And to give you some context, I'm just going to share my screen and show you a map of the Quadi region um, and sort of what we define that as. So. So if you can see, there's the map on my screen and the Quadi region is part of the Outer Bay of Fundy stretching from Point La Pro to Grand Manan across to the main coast and encompassing Passamaquoddy Bay and the Western Isles. All right, so let me introduce our speaker for today, Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith is the founder of Seascape Kayak Tours, 
and the lead guide for most of the company's adventures. He has 25 years of outdoor leadership experience and in 2010 was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the New Brunswick Department of Environment. In addition to creating Seascape, Bruce has spearheaded an alternative education program for at-risk Cree youth in Northern Quebec involving traditional Cree land-based activity, activities, academic upgrading and life skill development. He's also worked for the Mexican government to assist in the development and delivery of the Mexican Sea Kayak Guide Certification Program and has developed outdoor courses and adventure training for the federal government, the New Brunswick government, the New Brunswick Special Olympics, the Ministry of Community and Social Services, as well as various other institutions and outdoor centers. He holds a degree in sports science and secondary education and is fluent in French, English, and Spanish. So I'm very excited that Bruce has agreed to speak with us tonight um, and share some insight into the region as well as an expedition he's going to be taking next year. Um, and he'll be explaining all of that. So I'll let him get started. Why don't you take it away, Bruce? Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Annika. Um, and welcome to, you know, everybody who's joining in from the province and in other locations. Um, like to say thanks to CPAWS and Annika and Roberta for pulling this, this series, this coastal connection series together. Um, the word connection means an awful lot to me. And I think when we talk about conservation and protection of our special places, of our wild spaces, uh, the only way we can really do that is if we have a, a deep, personal connection to those places. And then we've got a good chance to do some work. Um, as uh, Annika was, was talking about the series, um, one of the, the items or one of the ideas that we talked about was that this was gonna be a, a fireside chat. Um, and the way that virtual technology is played, um, you know, we'll have to be a little creative and we'll have to use our imagination a little bit for the next hour. And my preference, as I mentioned to Annika, would be to sit around a fire and have the warmth of the fire and an opportunity for us to share um, from the heart, to share stories and, and share experiences. But we'll, we'll try to work through um, the technology that we have and just really um, happy that people have been able to join us tonight. Um, so I started this little kayaking company called Seascape Kayak Tours uh, back in 1993. And um, the vision, uh, the goal behind developing this, this program, uh, this experiential um, tourism uh, adventure tour company out of St. Andrews back then was to help people make a connection to the Bay of Fundy, um, Passamaquoddy Bay, uh, and a pretty amazing marine ecosystem. Uh, the, the company has kind of moved in lots of different directions in the last 28 years. Um, seems like a million years, but we'll, we'll stick with 28 years. Um, the company is based on Deer Island right now which is in the middle of, of the West Isles region of the Quadi region. Um, and we kind of run trips here from May until um, October, end of October. Uh, we also do trips uh, in the Northeast coast of, of Newfoundland in an area called the Bay of Exploits. And for about the last 25 years, I've been lucky to be able to spend winters down running a permanent base of operations on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Um, you know, and when I think about Costa Rica, everybody knows it as uh, an ecotourism destination. Um, you know, the volcanoes, uh, the different bioregions, beaches, rainforests, cloud forests, um, tremendous wildlife. But when I think about the Bay of Fundy, and especially the Quadi region um, of the Bay of Fundy, 
it's it's every bit as significant as a rainforest environment in in Costa Rica that people just don't know about it. Um, one of the silver linings, if you want to call it that, of the pandemic last year and and even this summer, a lot of local people, a lot of New Brunswickers who have never been to Deer Island, have traveled down to do a trip with me on on the bay, um, and make a connection with this absolutely beautiful marine environment. Um, so it, it, it feels good to get local people on the water here and to understand how precious it, it truly is. Um, so when we, we, we think about um, tourism, when we think about um, taking people on the water, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, I've done this for about 28 years and, you know, every morning I get up and I get boats ready um, and I get out on the bay with people. I, I really feel blessed um, to, to be able to do that for a living um, and spending so much time on the bay. Uh, taking visitors from all over the world out on the bay, you know, I've developed a really strong passion, um, deep connection, uh, love, spiritual connection for uh, this part specifically. I mean, the whole bay is, is close to my heart, but specifically this, this part of the bay that we call the West Isles region or the West Isles archipelago. And the chief of the Passamaquoddy First Nation, Hugh Akaji, who is who is a close friend, um, I would I would consider him to be a brother. When we talk about this time on the water, um, and we talk about the connections, um, we we also talk about the sensitivity and being able to to feel the heartbeat of of Mother Earth. And um, over the years. You know, I, I've, I've seen the beauty that this part of the Bay of Fundy has to offer, but I've also felt an urgency um, that, that we need to do something quickly in, in order to provide some lasting protection for this place before we, we lose it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and hopefully when we get into the Q&A at the end, we'll have a good sort of discussion. Um, I guess back in 2017, um, I had a really uh, busy, busy paddling season. And although I love to get out there and exchange energy with people, um, I felt like at the end of the paddling season that um, I just needed to unplug. I just needed to get away. Um, so I put together what, what I would call a traditional vision quest. And all that really means is, is some sacred time where you can go um, and be by yourself and um, ask some questions of the creator um, for your, your personal future direction and, and for other things that might be floating around in your life. So I, uh, I packed up a boat with not a whole lot of um, gear or supplies and paddled out to an island in the region, not too far from where my, my base of operations is on Deer Island but a little island um, called Casco Island, which is almost halfway between Deer Island and Campobello. And um, just a magic island for many, many reasons. It's right in the middle of a whale feeding ground. Um, it was the summer uh, fishing grounds for the Passamaquoddy First Nation who would you know, come down in the spring and summer and fish um, and harvest porpoise, and then they would move back up uh, to the mainland. So when you get on this island, there's, there's a definite energy on this island that, that you feel. Um, and you feel uh, the energy from the Passamaquoddy Nation. And as um, Annika sort of acknowledged, the Wabanaki Confederacy 
um, an alliance, I would really, you know, like to, to thank the Passamaquoddy Nation, the people who were here for thousands of years and lived in harmony uh, in this region and took care of this region and were good stewards of this region before we sort of came along and started to screw things up. But back to the island, um, back to my four days. Uh, so I didn't bring a whole lot of food, um, very little water. Um, and I spent four days in a simple camp, um, doing some meditation, sitting around fire, um, doing some yoga, doing daily walks, um, and writing in a journal and, and asking those questions that were important to me at that time. So, you know, what I was doing or what I could be doing in the future and what we could be doing collectively in order to, to protect this, this just amazing marine environment that, that we call the West Isles um, and expanding that region to the Quadi region. And before I, I sort of go on, um, in, in the spirit of using our, our imagination and our creativity, um, I would like to take you to uh, that island. Um, I would like to give you uh, a sense of place um, of that island. Um, and I, I really would like you to feel the, the energy from that island. So uh, Annika and I have got a, a short film that we'd like to, uh, to show you. Um, it's called The Window. It was developed as a promotional piece for this uh, passion project that we'll talk about when we come back from um, having a quick look at this, this film. Um, and Greg Hemmings from Hemmings House Pictures in, in uh, St. John was key in, in the production and a really talented filmmaker, a young filmmaker from Aspen, Colorado, Will Sardinsky, um, came down and spent about 10 days shooting with me. And um, it's a beautiful story. Um, it's a beautiful sense of place. And uh, let's, let's take you there. So Annika, if you could roll that, it would be great. I feel the rhythm of the tides. I feel joy. I feel peace. I feel clean energy in this beautiful place. The Bay of Funde is a unique highly productive ecosystem with some of the highest tides in the world. Dynamic water is full of nutrients and lots of sea life. The Bay of Funde provides us with food provides us with jobs and money, and it provides the animals with a home. But in the past few years, it has come under threat from over-harvesting of resources. And the 
Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry. My name is Bruce Smith, and I've worked as a sea kayak guide in these waters for over 25 years. Seeing the damage that was happening, I knew I needed to do something. At the end of a busy paddling season, I wanted some time where I could be still and be with myself and ask for answers that I was looking for. So I decided to do a traditional vision quest. I paddled out to Casco Island with no food, little water, and my journal to search in my heart, to meditate, to listen, to feel, and to find the path forward. I spent four days on the island. I asked the creator what we can do to protect this special marine ecosystem we call the Bay of Funding. And a very strong, clear answer came to that question. The need to do a long distance paddle to connect people to our sacred waters, to give this place a voice, to ultimately have this area receive designation as a marine protected space. I returned home thinking, wow, that's a wonderful idea, but how do I do that? So as I was doing the vision quest, the idea of a long distance paddle came to the forefront. The plan is that I'm going to paddle from Ottawa, the nation's capital, to Deer Island in the Bay of Fundy my home. This will take four months and along the way we'll hold celebrations that will bring Canadians together to celebrate our connections to the ocean and our sacred waters to give this fragile ecosystem a voice. Right now, there's a window to protect this place, and it's open, but not for long. We only have a few years to work towards permanent, lasting protection. And if we don't step up now, that window will soon close. Thanks, Annika. Um, sorry about it. It seemed to be moving a little slowly, but uh, regardless, you know, I think everybody should have felt the connection 
um, and it's 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 so so important um, to do that. So the idea, um, the answer that I received while I was out on the island, as I mentioned in the film, is to create an awareness program. Um, it's pretty easy for me uh, to take people out paddling into that, that beautiful area. Um, and people make that connection very naturally, very easily. Um, but it's, it's how to bring that, that connection, that awareness of how truly special this place is to a, a larger audience to a provincial audience, to a Canadian audience, to an international audience, um, and to, to do, develop that awareness, to develop the connection, and to develop the love for the place. So the, this long distance paddle um, became, became a concept, it became a vision. And um, over the last number of years, uh, that started to move forward. The name of the project was Rivers to Ocean. Um, initially, it was going to be a four-month project, paddling from Ottawa all the way down the St. Lawrence, eventually coming to the headwaters of the St. John River or the Willistook River. Um, all the way down throughout the province to the Bay of Fundy and then paddling west and arriving in the West Isles region. Um, celebration would happen along the way, uh, bringing all sorts of different people together uh, to celebrate our, our connection to water, uh, the importance of protecting both freshwater ecosystems, ocean ecosystems, um, and putting the West Isles region of the Bay of Fundy on our radar screen as, as a fragile, unique um, marine ecosystem that was sort of crying out for protection. And another word that I, I would use or another sort of vision or concept is to really give this area a voice you know, to give all the animals in this area a, a voice because they, they don't. Um, and so the work moved forward, the energy moved forward, uh, CPAWS nationally um, became involved and we were very, very supportive of the concept. Uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op became involved. Um, the Suzuki Foundation became involved. And just things were happening, things were great, and then COVID hit. And so I uh, had to sit back and understand that um, the journey couldn't happen um, in 2020 when it was initially supposed to take place. So after a lot of, of sort of thinking, um, it got put on the back burner. And I came back to the Bay of Fundy from Costa Rica and had a really good paddling season um, and thought about developing a, an expedition that would be a little more local, a little more organic, and that could happen regardless of the COVID situation. And that was um, planned for this summer, but as the way things go and some things um, we're, we're not in charge of our, our lives or the way that things happen and things happen for a reason. Um, but the Woolastook Way people, the river people in, in New Brunswick who had become very involved in the project um, this spring when we found out about the residential school crisis and the missing children and the unmarked graves, the grand chief, um, of the Willistook Way, uh, Ron Tromley asked me to wait one more year to kind of work through the healing that needed to take place um, and then launch the River to Ocean expedition next summer in, in 2022. So after, after working through a number of different years, a number of different scenarios, um, that's when things are gonna happen. Um, and I'm going to put a lot of energy into 
uh, this project for next summer. And things will kick off next June, World Oceans Day. Um, and instead of, uh, um, you know, this long four month approach, we'll look at a, a month. It'll be focused in New Brunswick. On June 8th, it'll start at the northern part of the province in Edmondson and Madawaska and come down the Woolastook River um, and into the Bay of Fundy and then end up in the West Isles region of the Bay of Fundy. Um, working with, with Indigenous communities along the way will be essential and in bringing Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities together um, to celebrate our connections to water um, and the healing nature of water, which is, I think, super, super important with our relations with Indigenous communities now. Um, it'll focus still on um, the West Isles region of the Bay of Fundy um, and working together to develop lasting protection for this part of the Bay of Fundy. And with the Willistook Way people, the river people, they've asked me to add an element to the journey being that um, they would like to work on the reclamation of the name from the St. John River to the proper name of the Willistook River. And because of everything that I mentioned to you, I think that that fits in very, very well with the River Ocean vision. Um, and so, you know, I guess some, some last comments from me, and I, I really would like to open things up to the audience and, and to feel your, your questions or your thoughts or your ideas concerning this, this project. Um, it's a huge undertaking. It's gonna take uh, a lot of people being involved in order to have the impact that it really needs to. Um, but as I've said, you know, if we bring people together, if um, people make a connection to this place, um, if uh, people have a love for this, this region, for the river, for um, this part of the Bay of Fundy, then we have a good chance at moving things um, forward. And um, giving voice to the area, which I, I've also touched on, um, I, I like to, to share stories. Um, and that's often the way that I, I like to work with people on the water and, and all sorts of different folks that I work with. But the one story that I, I would like to share quickly, um, and then maybe Annika can moderate some of your questions. Um, Last summer, um, beautiful summer of paddling opportunities with people. And I had a, a young couple in their 30s who were um, down to do a full day trip and they were celebrating their, their uh, first year of marriage. And beautiful calm day, got out on the water with these folks and headed out to some of the islands where we can sit and watch some um, whales. And we were watching a, a whale called Slice. Um, Slice is a, is a minke whale that's lost its, its dorsal fin because of being hit by a, a boat propeller. And it's a, it's a regular visitor here in the summer, the spring and summer. Um, we were watching this, this whale do its thing and, and making a connection with the whale and this young couple and I were just enjoying time in that environment. And it disappeared eventually. Slice went further south or wherever he was traveling that day. And I saw a little bit of a, a, a motion in a patch of seaweed and decided to go in and see what it was. And I told these folks, just hang out here. I just want to see, it looks like a bird that's in, in trouble. And I, uh, I paddled over and it was a young, um, it was an eaglet, um, beautiful, beautiful white, white bird. Um, 
And obviously it had come out of its nest uh, too early and, and couldn't fly and ended up landing on the rocks and um, breaking its neck. And it couldn't move, so I just brought my hands underneath uh, the eagle and, and lifted it up. And we had a couple of minutes of sort of looking at each, each other um, and had that instant connection, instant energy transfer, uh, and then it passed. It, it died in, in my arms. And I looked at the folks that I was paddling with and uh, they were understanding and we just made the decision to uh, take this eaglet up to an island in the island chain um, about half an hour away and uh, we ended up building a little cairn um, giving um, thanks for its life giving it blessings putting some wild roses and some um, shells and things like that um, and just sending the little eagle on its its way after its its short life, and a lot of messages from that uh, little story, and it it's taken me a long time to process those um, messages. Um, but one of them is in the, the the title that Annika and I have talked about this um, session being is is the window or it's time. And this young eaglet was definitely telling me that um, it was telling me that, that um, this area needs a voice. Um, and we need to collectively uh, do what we can in order to protect this, this place um, for future generations and for the animals that live in this, this beautiful spot. So um, Rivers to Ocean 2022, CPAWS is gonna be very involved. Um, some of the other organizations that I mentioned to you will be involved. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work um, and it's gonna take a lot of, lot of energy from people to uh, be part of it behind the scenes and on the river. Um, and I, I send out to everybody who's listening uh, a warm, warm invitation to, to join in, in whatever capacity you want to. Um, but that's how good things happen when people do come together um, to protect special places. So thank you, folks. Um, I'll turn it back over to you. Annika. Perfect. Well, thank you, Bruce, for, for sharing and telling us your story. That touching story about the eagle at the end. I've heard that before and it still gets me. So thank you. And those beautiful images and the video. I know you said you like to bring us to a sense of place and I definitely definitely felt like I was there. So as Bruce mentioned, we'll open up the floor to questions um, and have a little discussion about anything you want to ask him about Rivers to Oceans and his work in the Quadi region. Uh, feel free to use the chat. Emily will monitor that and we'll get her to read out some questions. Alternatively, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do so as well or just um, use the little emoji and raise your hand and I can call on you um, to speak. Uh, we have a question from Danielle. She says, I am wondering if over the years of running your business, have you noticed any changes in the number of people who are interested in stewardship and protecting the area? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you, um, Emily, for reading that one and Danielle for, for sort of sending it. And yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, initially with paddling, um, people want to get out for the adventure and a paddle's a paddle. Um, I've always taken a different approach with that. And when people come out, as I mentioned, 
I want them to make a connection with the place. And part of that is really good interpretation um, and letting people know the positive parts of the environment they're paddling in, but some of the challenges with the fisheries and with pollution and with climate change and all of those sorts of things. And yeah, I think to me, that's the ultimate goal of ecotourism is sort of giving people that connection. And then people start to really want to engage and they want to be involved in stewardship and protection. And a lot of people will say at the end of a paddle, okay, look, I love this place. What can I do to help? So there's lots of ways to help. And, and this journey, the reverse the ocean is, is part of that. Um, and the next step is kind of, you know, to develop a foundation where people can, if they can't be there helping, then they can support uh, the protection and conservation of this area financially. Um, I have a question. Um, so I'm new to this area mm -hmm. and uh, I live in St. Andrews mm -hmm. and um, I'm an eco poet and I have had the privilege of meeting uh, two other um, poets in this area and um, we're just in the midst of looking at some project ideas for the winter here in St. Andrew. And um, you talk about voice, which is what in my heart and mind poetry is about, is about giving voice, um, expressing voice. Um, and I'm just wondering if who how like if how, if there's some way that I could speak to someone from your organization about facilitating something here in St. Andrews looking at um, different poetry traditions um, mm -hmm. that could lend voice to your project uh, I don't know I'm just that's, that's what came to my mind. Yeah, yeah, but you're you're right on point with that. Um, you know, we were trying to condense a lot of things into a short period of time, and I would have liked to have gone through a lot more detail about this journey. Uh, but it's kind of from my perspective, planting a seed, Louise. And as I mentioned, for this month-long expedition, um, there's going to be stops along the way, both in indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities. And a big part for me um, with those stops is there'll be celebration um, and it'll be bringing people down to the water um, and it'll be uh, indigenous ceremony, um, but there will also be you know, food, there'll also be music, there'll also be art also okay. all of those sorts of things because as you know as a poet it you touch people in different ways and uh there's a huge opportunity um to do and contribute that way you know okay yeah okay so um okay is there someone that or is there a contact that that i could make just to further this idea um yeah, we can either through Annika, or Annika? You can, okay. yeah, or you can you can contact me directly, just at uh, Bruce at seascapekayaktours dot com, okay. and we can we can have a conversation. Okay, because about... right now they're, they're the Kiwanis are actually asking for proposals for money. <laughs> um, I don't know what the deadline is. Like I said, I'm brand new here, so. Uh, you know, but I thought, well, you know, if there might be a way, because I know resources or financial resources are always needed too. Yep. But okay, I'll do, I'll reach out to you. Thank you. Awesome.
Okay, we have a question from Mel Melanie. Uh, Bruce, could you say more about the name River to Ocean and the connection between the river and the bay? Sure. Um, I mean, a, a quick answer to that, Melanie, would be um, this this uh, project, this this passion project, you know, started. I'm going to say 15 years ago, and I had somebody from the uh, Vancouver Aquarium at that time, who is uh, in charge of the Canada-wide coastal cleanup program. And um, she, out of the blue, asked me whether it would be possible to paddle from Toronto to the East Coast. Um, because what she was trying to do at that time was to make a connection between our inland water ways and our big financial centers and the ocean because the Toronto Dominion Bank at that point was funding the Canada-wide coastal cleanup program and they were really questioning why they were funding something from Toronto that involved our coastal regions or our coastal areas and for me um, they're, they're, they're both synonymous they're, they're both so integral to the health of both environments. Um, and I can't imagine saying, okay, the river is the river and, and you know, the way that it flows is, is, is meaningless because when it empties into um, the Bay of Funday, you know, magic happens. And our ocean environment depends on that healthy river flow um, just as much as the river um, sort of depends on, on our ocean environment. And in dealing with um, the indigenous people between the river and the ocean, it's, it's a connection. And that's the way that they used to sort of move up and down um, the river and communicate and, and meet and do all sorts of things like that. So, I mean, it's wildlife, it's the ecosystem, it's the mixing of fresh and, and salt water, um, but it's also going back to the people that used to travel along that, those waterways for, for years and years and years and years. Okay, we have a question from Debbie. There are so many voices in today's world. Some express the goals of conservationists, naturalists, environmentalists. Some speak to the reality that the world's human needs, food, energy sources, transportation, corridors, supply lines. Some focus on the economy, but leave out the way in leave out the way and emphasis on making money and make it for the oceans and rivers. Some confess frustration with how to make a difference. Do you have any ideas of how to have all of these voices to bring? Hmm. That's, a, that's a huge question. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, I guess the way that I would answer that question is, um, coming up with a, a model, a working uh, model um, for a, an environment and for protection of an environment like the West Isles region of um, the Bay of Fundy. And on the West Coast, Haida Gwaii or the Queen Charlotte's um, Parks Canada, um, it was an indigenous, it was the Haida nation that really um, planted the seed to develop a park out there, a marine park, you know? And you've got all sorts of competing interests. You've got fisheries, you've got logging, you've got ecotourism, you've got um, the indigenous nation that, that wants some of their um, ways of life uh, supported and taken care of. 
um, but they were able to bring all interest groups together um, and through a lot of discussion, um, providing an environment where people felt safe to share their opinions and it's okay to, to agree to disagree, um, but everybody looked at that model about the, that proposal and it made sense because in the long term, um, it, was, it was more sustainable uh, for everybody. And it was a win-win situation for everybody. And the problem that we have, um, it's not just we, you know, in New Brunswick or Canada or it's internationally, um, when people come to the table to discuss um, doing something collectively, everybody holds their cards to their chest, you know, instead of being open um, and thinking about different viewpoints and making decisions because they're the right decisions to make. And another word there is, is, is trust. Um, and that's true with, with uh, some of our difficulties now that our indigenous communities are facing you know, and racism. And we need to accept that there is a problem before we find solutions. And that's true with, with um, ecotourism, it's, it's, it's true with fisheries, it's true with, with all of those competing interests. We just need to come together in a safe environment, have the hard discussions, um, and then work together for the collective good. Of, of protecting our, our special places. It can't be, you know, environmentalists on one side and, and business on the other. But it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard situation. But the first part is finding that common ground, you know, where people can come and sit and share around this, this fireside kind of chat and, and move things forward. All right, we have another question from Danielle. Um, you have a wonderful vision behind the expedition. What is something you are hoping to learn or that others will learn along your journey next summer? Wow. I'm, I'm hoping to learn a lot um, because I've done a lot of work with, with indigenous communities. Um, I'm learning or I'm looking forward to learning a lot from our Indigenous communities and involving our Indigenous communities as, as much as possible. Um, I, I, you know, want to learn or I want to feel like um, there is hope um, when we want to do something collectively. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing people come together um, and, and a really good vibration, you know, and, and come together collectively to do something together. Um, and, you know, I'm learning, or I wanna learn more about the river. Um, I haven't paddled that river before. And I wanna learn more about that freshwater um, ecosystem. And um, yeah, I, I, I just want to learn and feel that, that there is hope and uh, that we can do some good things together. Perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Um, well, we're just coming up on eight o'clock. So I think that's all the time we're gonna have for questions. Um, although I just wanted to say, just note one thing um, that was meant, that just got posted in the chat, which I think is really important um, from Nikki is that we have a term in my culture called a tuaf monk, and I'm not sure if I pronounced that properly. And it's called two-eyed seeing, and it's a way of learning where we look at both the Western and indigenous knowledge. Um, and I think that's really important, especially for this expedition and other things moving forward, um, especially in the space that, that we work in. 
Um, so thanks for sharing that. With me. And thank you, Bruce, for sharing about your expedition and your thoughts on the region and um, connecting to a place, which is, I think, something that really stood out for me is for someone to want to protect something, connection is really important. And that's what I'll be taking away. And learning about rivers to oceans, I think, is a fitting way to launch the speaker series on coastal connections. Um, we know that the coast plays such a vital role in the health of the ocean, the planet, humans, um, and we need to protect it as much as possible. Um, New Brunswick is surrounded by the ocean, including the Quadi region, and it's definitely a responsibility we have to take care of it. Um, just like Bruce at CPAWS, we also are looking to protect the Quadi region. And for those of you that are interested, we encourage you to take part in whatever actions you can to advance ocean protection. Um, any actions, no matter how small, really do make a difference. If you want to stay engaged with Rivers to Oceans, um, be involved in some of the events that might be taking place along the route next year, um, be sure to check out Rivers to Oceans website. Hopefully there will be some updates there soon and Emily will put a link in the chat for that. Um, if you wanna learn more about some of the work CPAWS is doing in marine conservation, you can also check out our website and social media. Um, and if you're not from around the region or you're interested in ocean protection where you live, Google is a great resource. You can look up sort of what organizations, indigenous nations or governments are doing in your area and get involved that way. One last thing I do wanna mention um, is that we'll be having a couple more speakers and I'll just share my screen really quick. So our next speaker will be November 4th, Sebastian from the Canadian Will Institute. And then in January, moving all the way to the winter, we'll have um, Dr. Craig Goodwin from the Huntsman Marine Science Center. And you can register for each of those events on the Facebook page where you found the link for this talk as well. So that concludes the evening. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in, for listening, for all of the wonderful questions. Um, looks like we made some connections tonight, which is wonderful. And I hope you guys all have a really good evening. And thank you. And thank you to Bruce again. Thanks, Annika, for doing the technology. And please, open invitation for people to become involved with Rivers to Ocean on so many different levels. Great. Uh, we'll say good night.